and welcome to the Sci Guys, the show where we talk about the crazy, weird, and wonderful stories from the science world. I'm Corey, and as always, I'm joined by my co-hosts, Jeb and Luke Cutford. Hi. Hi, howdy. This week, we're talking about GMO tickers and pork pumps. G- uh, ooh, ooh. But first... Why don't we look at a little Apple review? Okay. So this Sweet. one comes from Angry Face K. It is, <laughs> I know, but it's five stars. And I've just checked actually our Apple score, our Apple like thing. It's five out of it's five out of five stars. It's been on four point nine for so long. We've ah, hit five stars. Wow. Very good. You guys have been leaving so many five star reviews, which is awesome. Please leave some more, and we'll read them out on the show. So this one says, "Absolutely fantastic podcast. A perfect mix of actual science and dumb conversations. It's currently my favorite podcast, and I would Aww. recommend it to anyone wanting to learn about science in a more interesting way." Oh, that is Thank so you. nice. I also think that Angry Face K might be a more discerning person on average, and yet we have impressed her. So that's lovely. Why well, you assume it's a her? Angry Face K. K, as in the letter K. Oh, I thought it was the name K. Nope. The woman's letter name K. K. Just angry right. face, well, the letter you can K. Just, you can just cut that out if you like. <laughs> <laughs> and a question for you all. Head down to the YouTube comments if you have not already and answer this. Would you be an organ donor? I'm genuinely curious. If you're listening on audio, then get yourself to the YouTube comments and answer it. Go ahead. There's plenty of other stuff on the Sci Guys YouTube channel. Why don't we start the show? You don't want my organs. They're rotten. Yeah. <laughs> ah. ah. <laughs> I've seen him. Oh, uh, yeah. No. So, we've spoken about translabs before on the show, and we've spoken about it a few times, actually. And as always, I've got to say that they are a miracle of science and medicine. Surgery is just, like, the coolest thing, right? Like, it's crazy, the fact that we can just cut someone open, mess around a bit, mm. and then put them back together, yeah. and, like, chop some bits off, and it doesn't hurt the person. It actually yeah. makes them better. Sorry, can I just check? Uh, you're saying transplants? Transplants. Because at the start, it sounded like you said trans lives. Transplants. Okay. I thought you said trans lives. Really? Yeah, yeah. I was like, how does this... Did I say trans lives? You said, we've talked about trans lives a lot in the past. Yeah, I'm glad you picked... Well, I thought that's what I heard, and I was like, I must have misheard that. Okay. <laughs> um, so we've spoken about transplants. We've also spoken about trans lives. We we've have. spoken about trans This is why I was yeah, confused, because yeah. we've done both of these things. Weird. But I'm talking about transplants. It's one of those things where it's like, oh, is your body bothering you? Let me just chop some of it off, and you'll feel good again. There you go. It's insane. It's insane that it happens. Yeah. So, like, from a layman's perspective, I just feel like surgery shouldn't work at all. Like, yeah. It, it no, doesn't make it, sense. It looks like you're hurting the person, but you're not hurting the person. You're making them stronger. You're making them better. You're making yeah. them better. <laughs> like, it's insane. It feels wrong. And the only reason I think, I realized this whilst I was writing this episode, the only reason you don't think that surgery is, like, weird or strange or insane is because you have grown up in a world where it's always existed. Mm. If we didn't have surgery and someone tried to introduce it, like, tomorrow, you'd think they were insane. You'd think they were unhinged. Yeah, you would actually. You would, right? Yeah. You wouldn't, you'd be like, this, like, maybe we won't do this thing where we just like, you know, completely reconstruct someone's face or, you know, chop open someone's heart and mess around with it for yeah. a bit. You might like, get the hacking up your body. Exactly. Your, your dialogue you get from like transphobes. <laughs> it's weird because yeah. I suppose <laughs> the fact that it works kind of shows that in, in, although the mechanisms by which it works are very complex, it also shows that in some ways, in certain ways, the body is more simple than we would think it's very crude yeah because you don't it doesn't have to just like grow from like grow from scratch and then you can't do anything to it um you can just chop a bit out and then put it in another one and it will kind of work it's, it's very robust like the mm. surgery wherein you if someone's got uh if, so if someone's got say like a, i think it's a really you can have a really aggressive bone cancer or the um the, the sort of the bone of your shin has um like deteriorated so greatly that you need you need it to be amputated but your foot is fine and you, you need to be. You need to. I think yes. you have need to have the knee joint amputated. Mm. Yes. So you've got a perfectly good ankle joint there. Mm. So what they do is they just cut off the part of the leg that is that mm-hmm. is not okay. They take the ankle joint and they attach your foot backwards to where your knee would be, and then you've got a. You could have a prosthetic leg and yeah. a working knee. Yeah. There's made a few from people on TikTok becomes, who do videos. Yeah. I was about to say this. Great. I thought it was special effects when I first saw it because I saw a couple of TikTok <laughs> accounts. Yeah. And I was like, this is fake, obviously. It's <laughs> but mad. No, it's real. It's mad. And bodies can just do, like, you just do that. And it's like, okay, I guess my foot is my, I guess my, like, my ankle is my knee now. Cool. Okay. Yeah. And to the, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but I'd love to ask somebody who's had this surgery done. 
Does it feel like they're moving their ankle or does it feel like they're moving their knee? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I remember watching a video where someone explained this. Oh, this is so so interesting, right? Maybe we should do a video on one of those surgeries and have someone um someone on. Yeah. If you've got if you know a TikToker or something that um that's had this surgery that's really that really like enjoys talking about it, let us know in the comments and we'll 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 see if we can get them on to talk about this kind of surgery. That right? is so good. But recently surgery took a step up and became like incredibly more metal. There is a brand new kind of surgery happening happening a xenotransplantation um or xenotransplants and it is incredible a man had a genetically modified pig heart transplanted into him and he is still alive and well the pig is not no the man is not the pig the pig is definitely dead the man is alive and well (laughs) just started like honking (laughs) (laughs) but the man is alive and well with like living with a pig heart have you heard about this I thought we'd been doing no. this for a lot longer than. You think so? Oh, what? I thought they'd been doing something with pig organs for quite a while. Have we been using other organs and nope. pigs? Well, think we'll get. We into, started with the heart. Well, we'll get into. Well, yeah. Mm, well, we've done. We'll get into the history of it. Okay. But we the sort of xenotransplants are very new. <gasps> Is about, that why uh, it's xeno? Because it's foreign, from foreign, like from a foreign species. species. Yeah. <laughs> My, in my notes, it said, you might hear a xenotransplant and think someone's reading out like a neogender on their Twitter profile, but let's break it down. And then literally the <laughs> definition of xenotransplant. Um, but yeah. A pig heart's similar size to human hearts. Oh my God, yeah. Oh, I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, I that's what's a coming up later. Being like the yeah. size of a head. No, no, I it's, 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 pigs are actually, I've got a lot of weird similarities with humans, yeah. with humans, because they're omnivores as well, they've got really similar teeth to us, um, which is oh, always really no. weird and strange. No, they do, they've got very similar tooth setup. up. Um, they're similar in that sense. I think we used pig insulin for a, for quite a while before we started manufacturing. Um, we did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, before we started manufacturing insulin using, uh, I think, microorganisms. But um, yeah, I think we, we might even still use pig insulin. I'm not totally sure on that. But yeah, we've like, we used pigs for a lot of things beyond just, you know, pork and bacon. Uh, they're really interesting. But um, yeah, so xenotransplant, xeno meaning uh, strange or foreign from the Greek, uh, trans across, which is Latin, and then um, plant from plantare to plant Latin. Yes. It's taking a, str- uh, taking a, a foreign thing and transplanting it into someone's body. Um, essentially, it's when you take organs or tissues or cells from one organism and implant it into an organism of another species. So this definition I've got here is from the FDA. It says, Xenotransplantation is any procedure that involves the transplantation, implantation, or infusion into a human recipient of either A, live cells, tissues, or organs from a non-human animal source, or B, human body fluids, cells, tissues, or organs that have had ex vivo contact with live non-human animal cells, tissues, or organs. What that means is essentially if you take something from an animal that is not a human Mm. and put it into a human, like uh, for a medical reason, you know, like, you know, like not just making them eat (laughs) it, like surgically implant it. (laughs) um, Or you take a part of a person out, um, mess with it in like a test tube or something with some animal cells and then put it back in. Those are both, you know, transplantation. When they grew an ear on the back of a mouse. They, oh, that's, this is, this, no, they didn't, they didn't. (laughs) They didn't, they didn't. What they, so when they grew an ear on the back of a mouse, they didn't grow a human ear on the back of a mouse. What they did was they made a mouse grow a stri- cartilage the sh- yeah. in the shape in of the a pinna. Of an ear. The outside of an ear. Yeah. 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 That, is, that is a really, really annoying. Because I remembered, I think. <laughs> it's an important distinction. Well, no, I remember thinking that was a. Because I think I saw it on South Park. We've spoken about this on the podcast before. But what is an ear if not just cartilage in the shape of an ear? Yeah, but it's it wasn't. It's, it's not a human ear. It's not like they I don't it's not like they just turned on the genes for a human ear on a mouse and made it grow that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, although I think there are things there is either this is I can't remember if this is happening or not yet, but there is the idea of growing parts body parts. I think you like you I think you sort of start growing it in a test tube and then you can sew it into the person and then it grows a little bit more in there. I can't remember what this is. Uh, I might have to look into it for another episode, but something to look into if you're interested in this sort of thing. They can go willies that way, can't they? No. Okay. I guess. <laughs> No, I think I've seen that. That was South Park. It might have been South. Yeah, when when they when they found out about the mouse having an ear on its back, <laughs> they made an episode about growing that on a. But the issue is that it's not human tissue. Oh, that's so. I'm funny. pretty sure. So you couldn't xenotransplant you know, that specific ear onto a onto a person. You, you wouldn't. It'd be it's far easier just to get a, a like a prosthetic. Okay. For a pinna. <laughs> okay. Because it is just the when I say the pinna, it's the yeah. outer part of the yeah. ear, which yeah. there's no point in transplanting that when you can just get a. A plastic one, a right? That does the one. same job. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. And a Whereas magnetic one that just clips on and off. Really, when we're talking yeah. about transplants, it comes to joints and limbs, um, things that you that are harder to uh, mechanically make. I mean, limbs less so, but um, 
wait, so I say joints and limbs. I meant organs and limbs. Uh -huh. um, so uh, like, you know, limbs are, you can make them mechanically. So they're transplanted, pl transplanted way less often, but organs, they do specific jobs. It's kind of hard to like, you can have dialysis, sure. But it's you need to be in a hospital bed. Like you're not machine. carrying that yeah. thing around with you, you know? So that's where transplants really come in. It's for organs and things that are ascent because there's such, such risks associated with it. Um, but why do you think we're doing xenotransplants? To help people who have lost things or have poorly functioning organs. So let me ask the question again. Why specifically are we using xenotransplants? Oh, why specific? Um, <laughs> is it cost effective? Well, I would imagine there's a shortage of um, of those of organs. Yeah, absolutely. You're spot on. And you're basically like it's just a different type of farming. You're just changing the pig so yeah. that it grows a thing mm. that the human's body will accept, and then you're just killing the pig, which is you know sad, do it anyway. but you do it anyway. Yeah. And then you got a heart. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose if you want. Uh, if it passes all the tests, you could just eat the pig anyway. Yeah, what happens to the rest of the pig? I have no idea. I, they don't say that kind of thing. They usually tend to avoid talking about the, the killing the animals Yeah. In, in things like this. I mean, we'll, we'll get... Can in... you not give the pig a heart, a, a pig heart from another pig? Well, then it just goes down the chain, doesn't oh it? Oh my God. Like, until you find a pig that's got that's born with two hearts and then you... Then no, you, you just got to have a... You've you got to find a pig it. that's just recently, you know, been in an accident or something. Take its heart... <laughs> Because it's dead. You take its heart, transplant it into the donor pig. You can just do um, that with Luke, people as well. Yeah, I feel like you've just... <laughs> so the reason that we're... So I, I know that you've answered this question correctly, but I feel like you don't understand your answer. No, the I reason that, The reason that we're... <laughs> yeah. You've got to no. rely on people dying with viable organs. Yeah. That's, yeah. So that's actually... So I do understand that, but what no, I mean no, I is the, the pig that's genetically modified to grow a heart that we can accept yeah. could also itself have a pig heart, which we couldn't accept. Like just a normal pig heart, I assume, because we're genetically modifying this pig, we can't accept just a raw pig heart from a <laughs> from a pig. But the genetically modified pig might be able to accept a raw pig heart from a recently deceased pig. But then what I'm saying is There's not a you're... shortage of, of recently deceased pigs. I hate to break it to you, there's lots of recently deceased pigs. So Do you know what? How about this? Why let's would just, you pop? I don't understand the problem. <laughs> Is it the viability of doing the operation on the pig and they don't, they don't care about it enough? You have to do two operations no, then. I, just not Jab, I don't have it. Can you explain why this is a problem? Please. I don't want to. Please. Why, Please why is this a problem? I don't understand. Jab. I do <laughs> no, need you don't. to answer this now. <laughs> oh, okay, Luke, why yeah. would you... I just think that we've taken the thing we're already <laughs> doing to people Yeah. and just doing it to a pig instead. You're, you're, which you're, be... shifting, the pro you're shifting the problem, right? Yeah. Like The problem is that there's a shortage of organs because not it's, enough people are yeah. dying. And so if you're going to cover that with pigs, then you need to take the hearts out of recently deceased pigs and put them in those other pigs so that they'll live a certain amount of time. But also yeah. then you'll need to have a place to keep those all of those pigs that you're using for human organ transplants. For why? You have to for do a lower quality of life. You've grown them and taken their heart from them. So you, the least you could do is give them a replacement heart. Why not just eat them? Well, because that's sad. I don't eat them. Neither do you. I, yeah, but like, I mean, if you're killing a pig for a heart anyway, you may as well chow down on so it. So we're going to get to the point where oh, farmers, gosh. if this is, if this carries on and is successful, you're going to have like pig farms where all the pigs are growing kind of pseudo human hearts. And then when they go for slaughter, you take their heart and you yeah. give it to a person and then you make the pig into bacon. And then the person, Question. the person can eat the bacon off the pig. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Is it? Because then the person can eat the, the, the pig's bacon of the heart that's keeping them alive. I don't care then you've got a real person. moral quandary here because you're alive and you kind of want to be alive, but you're eating the thing that you killed in order to be alive. Oh. I'm not going to wait him, so I don't care. I didn't, I didn't expect this. So you're right. That is why we're researching uh, xenotransplants, Luke. I did fail to take into account that the majority of the human race doesn't particularly value the lives of pigs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was the problem I'd made. <laughs> yes. But, you know, I liked living in that naive world for a moment. This is like the, what the blankets is, for cows thing you, all over again. <laughs> <laughs> you're really pulling like a robbing Peter to pay Paul kind of situation where like we're taking this pig heart so we'll take this other pig and we don't want to kill the pig. So we'll take this pig that we've already killed and take its heart and give it to the pig that we that would die without the heart. Because he's, he's done us a service. <laughs> Grew us a heart. <laughs> <laughs> Got to give them a retirement fund. So the, that you're right about why we are doing xenotransplants, and I'll just reiterate that it's because there is a massive demand for human organs, uh, and the supply just could not meet the demand. Uh, and over six thousand people in the UK are waiting for organs right now. Over two thousand nine hundred have received an organ since April twenty twenty one. And in the US, 10 people die every single day waiting for organs, oh. which is, yeah, it's, in, it's an insane number. And you can donate a kidney or a liver or uh, some 
like bone marrow or other some other things as well. How many livers do we have? Uh, sorry, a bit of liver, <laughs> not a whole liver. <laughs> well, but you so can, your liver grows back. Yeah, so you can do, like, like your single liver can be donated to two separate people because the liver grows back. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Yeah, your liver. Yeah, your liver Does will it? regenerate. Like, your liver is an Why organ that just regenerates real I well. I don't know that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You can have loads of your liver cut off, and it'll just grow back to a full liver. Oh. Yeah, I mean, it's it's weird because you should do more of that. No, no ideally, no. we should do less of it. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. But think about it. This, your skin is your skin is the same. You can cut off some skin, and <laughs> your skin will grow back a little bit. Not quite as yeah. well as a liver. Your blood regenerates as well. Yeah. It's not really an organ, but yeah. you know, it it. it it's weird because most of our organs are very highly specialized and very specific, all the little structures in them. So it's very difficult to grow parts of those back because you'll probably die before um, right. before that happens. But with the liver, it's the way that it's, I think, set up makes it easier for you to survive long enough for you to regenerate it. And it's just capable of doing that. So you can donate parts of your a part of your liver or you can donate a kidney while you're still alive. And um, so I, I think that's... Over a thousand people do it every year in the UK. They donate a kidney or part of their liver. But most organ donations obviously come from people who are dead. dead. Yeah. And that is an issue. Why do you think it's an issue taking organs from dead people? They might not be working. Exactly. Yeah. So you need mm -hmm. to take organs from dead people who have got working organs, but often people who are dead. Freshly dead. Yeah. Fre well, that's the issue as well. But like There's car multiple crash issues victims here. Like, yeah. died for no reason because of their organs. Yeah, exactly. But you also need to make sure that the organs aren't damaged. Yeah. For in the in the in whatever killed the person. So it's 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 a tough thing. And I've actually got some stats here. It's actually quite interesting. Um, they, well, I'll give them to you in a second. They need to die with relatively healthy organs, if, like we've said. Yeah. And the organs need to be taken out prep for surgery before they go off. And it's not as simple as just scooping out an organ from a dead person and popping it in someone else. Like you need to. There's so many things need to go like right before you're able to do it. Mm. Um, and. It's it's interesting. So if you look at, uh, I think this is last year. So from the first of April, uh, the first of April, um, twenty twenty, to the thirty first of March, twenty twenty one, that year. Uh, so the number of donors in the UK that were don donors after brain death is seven hundred sixty six. So seven hundred sixty six people they, they had brain death. That's not a lot. So they could harvest their organs. Exactly. Donors after circulatory death. So basically, your heart mm. kaput. Um, that's four hundred fourteen. Total deceased donors was it was a thousand one thousand one hundred eighty, uh, which is down from the year before that, which was one thousand five hundred eighty total dead oh, people God. giving organs. Um, and then it it like so they had some living donors as well, but um, it it was like like that's way less, like under a thousand put together. It's it's absolutely mental. They've also got like they've also got stats if you go to the NHS, um, the blood and transplant blood and transplant part. They give you stats on the number of people that are just getting transplants. Like can you get a, it's updated weekly and everything? Mm. It's really interesting. It also tells you how many of them are under 18, which um don't don't you don't want to look at that. It'll make you sad. No, yeah, it's not fun. Not fun to look at. But uh, it is really it is really interesting um this whole transplant thing because the xenotransplantation can obviously help solve that problem by allowing us to grow genetically modified organs in animals and then harvesting them for human use. So it sounds pretty horrific when you say it like that, but it's still better than the meat industry, isn't it? Well, it's not worse. It might be weird. I suppose it's like a bit tangential because it's also like just a strange thing to do. Like it's like it's not so much an ethical thing in terms of the life. It's then getting into the whole world of ethics of genetic modification and blah 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 blah. People will go on about um yeah. So yeah, skip that stuff. It's kind of it's kind of strange in two ways. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, people often bring up concerns about genetic modification in the comments and. Like maybe it's the biotechnologist in me, but eh. maybe it's the knowledge that I have. No, no, I, <laughs> no. I'm talking about it more in a Jurassic Park, as in like you know, I'm able to do it, so I'll do it kind of thing. I'm, I'm not gonna think it through too much. I'll try and make yeah. sure that it, you know, th there aren't any ramifications for the planet. But I want dinosaurs, so I'm gonna make uh, dinosaurs. Kind no, of thing. that's what you're talking. We're back on this again. We're back on the dinosaur train. <laughs> no, so <laughs> dinosaur train. That's something I'd like to see. Ooh. Jurassic World Five. How are you gonna yeah. get your dinosaurs around without a dinosaur train? Ye yeah, that probably is the best way to get them around. Yeah. Trains are quite sturdy. Yeah, on We're rails. A big arc. Yeah, no Led chance of a car crash and the, the them getting out. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we pattern that dinosaur train right okay. now, and we'll, we'll sort it out later. What have I innovated other than it's a big train that dinosaurs can go in? Oh no! We'll make a latch that's dinosaur-proof. <laughs> that's pretty good, actually. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah. <laughs> that would have solved a lot of problems in Jurassic Park. Maybe it's powered by the dinosaurs, like pedaling or something. <laughs> ah, very <Yeah>. good. <laughs> Have Renewable, have, like, really high up handlebars for T Rexes. I, I forgot that the, the main issue with trains is how to power them. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the real problem we've been having with yeah. with, with locomotives. <laughs> well, there's just at the train, there's just holes in the floor, so the the dinosaurs' feet just run along. Oh, Fred Flintstone type of thing. Yeah, yeah. Could we please try and submit a patent for a dinosaur train and see if we can get it through? Yeah, like, try and think up some weird, stupid thing that allows the dinosaurs like. <laughs> To like, I don't know, they've got VR goggles on, so they think they're running, and then they've got a treadmill and they're running on it. And that specific set of innovations, we patent it, we own that patent. And that's just a thing that Psyguys <laughs> owns. Look, I don't know if you know the strict guidelines of patents. I do not know that far. No. I had to study it in university. One important thing is that it needs to have a use case, it needs to be useful, it needs to be novel and useful. So we've got the novelty well, it can down. be useful. Yeah. And there's definitely not going to be any prior answers. art. Yeah. Yeah. So again, novelty is good. Yeah. Use useful is more because the dinosaurs that we've got are generally chickens and whatnot, right? So we probably want to get dinosaurs that are not chickens. Okay. How about okay? We'll broaden it to say <laughs> just large, large animals, um, and then possible use hmm. cases. We'll list dinosaur trains. elephants. I'm not fussy as Giraffes, long as I can get whales. the word dinosaur. No, blue whales can't <laughs> oh, walk no, on a treadmill. Work. Unless you fill it with water. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but then still they can't. They haven't got legs. Jeez Louise. Well, can... What movement of the blue whale are you going to turn be, into electricity? Can, that one where you turn wave water. power. Yeah, wave power. That's it. Wave power. <laughs> I they can just flap. That's, I electric. Electric. that's <laughs> it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> we, quite ironically, no, quite ironically, in talking about this dinosaur train, have gone entirely off the rails. Let's hop back on and talk about the history of xenotransplantation, shall we? Oh, I'm so sorry, yes, please. Please, yeah. So, you were asking about this. You thought, Luke, that we've done this quite a bit. Or maybe it was just that I knew we were in, like experimenting with genetically modifying pigs to grow human organs. It's been a big news story, um, you know, a, I guess a month or two ago, so it's probably, it's probably in your head from then. I think uh, January, it was real big, and February, uh, like, start of February, it was also quite a big thing. Um, so, it, it's kind of newer than you'd think, but also it does have an, a long and old history. We've I, One of the papers I read, actually, really interestingly, it does, it does something that I really love when papers do. It spoke about mythology very briefly. Mm -hmm. had a very brief couple paragraphs on mythology, which is good because it provides important context for the scientific background because, you know, that's, it influences people. It, it makes sense. And if you look at a lot of cultures, there there is this fascination of the, the merging of human and animal. Like The, the one that came to me um, immediately was uh, Ganesha from uh, sort of Hinduism. You know, the elephant head on yes. the, the the human body uh which has a fantastic story behind it by the way definitely look into that one like ace love it but there's there's been this idea of human trans human animal transplantation uh for a long long time but the history of it is maybe about 300 or so years old apparently of people actually sort of trying to do this that's what i've found uh, uh, at least so it's only been recently that we've actually made steps forwards in all the other areas to make it possible, which is I love about science. You can you discover um, genetic modification and suddenly it opens doors where we can, mm. we can put a pig heart in someone. Amazing. So the interesting thing uh, about this is that, like we mentioned in our uterus episode, our uterus transplants episode, uh, that organ transplants are actually way more recent than we'd think. Like I think kidney transplants are not terribly like not too much older than us. Like our generation grew up with wow. um, organ transplants being. Mm. Um, just commonplace, normal, yeah. And it's really difficult for to, for us to imagine them not being the, not being like that. But yeah, they are like in the sort of twentieth century is when they really were able to do it. Like yeah. I think the mid to late twentieth century. So they are very very new things, which makes sense because they are very difficult to perform. So uh, the seventeenth to twentieth century. So between the seventeenth and twentieth centuries, uh, blood transfusions between animals and humans that that happened uh, between uh, then in the nineteenth century, skin grafts. Uh, were something that was happening. I think that ah. was when the first sort of skin grafts were happening. Frogs were the most popular, apparently. Bear in mind, these are all from animal to human. So uh, they would cover ulcers with frog skin. Probably they weren't permanent, though. Um, it was just until the sort of ulcer healed, I guess. And then it, the, basically the frogs using the frog skin as a, as like a scab. Like a plaster. Yeah, a yeah. plaster mm. as a scab. Yeah. Mm. Frogs are useful. They're great. Pregnancy tests, plasters. Really, if, you, if, you're, if you're running low on money, right? And you, you can't fill up your sort of medicine cabinet. Mm. Just pop down to the local pond, yeah. skip up a few tadpoles, 
keep some frogs in your ba- in your gar- in your bathroom. Yeah, that's it. That's I've all always need. yeah. I've always said frog skin was nature's band aid. Exactly. Yeah. And you pee on one to find out if you're pregnant or not. Well, oh, you pee fun. on a specific type of frog, not yeah. just a frog from the local pond. Huh. You don't know if that's the kind of frog in the pond. <laughs> you never know. Okay. You just keep getting keep getting frogs to get the result you want. Exactly. And you get another <laughs> kind of frog, and you know, oh, I'm feeling a bit. I've got a bit of pain. <laughs> Wow, I'm, I'm on a different oh, planet. I'm tripping. I'm tripping. <laughs> <laughs> Frogs are a, they are a cure all. They are a panacea, I think. Can I just check? Because I am actually genuinely interested to find out if you're just lying. Um, if I go to my local pond, uh, for example, in England, are there any use cases for the frogs in my local pond? Looking at because they're really cute. Well, um, sure, but he, it, specifically depression? to replace my medicine cabinet. Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm into like replace antidepressants. Oh my lord! What? What? I just searched this, and there's an article in the BBC from 2019: Escapee pregnancy test frogs colonized Wales for 50 years. Ah, so if you're in Wales, you can, you could, in the past, go down to your local pond, piss on some frogs, and find out if you're pregnant. Yeah, and also, um, do you remember the clawed frog we were talking about a while back? Oh yeah, the yes. Pregnancy test used to be African uh, clawed frogs, says Business Insider. Ah. So clawed frogs, very useful little, le- very useful little things. Would they and, try and claw you if you're pregnant? N- no, they've <laughs> just got claws on their three back feet, on their on their back toes. Remember? And interestingly, yeah. um, the the name, the Latin name of those, I say Latin name, that you know, the the, the name of those um those frogs, Zeno is in it. Remember? Ah. Right? Yeah, Which brings us back to the Xeno transplants. So. <laughs> <laughs> Without answering my question, continue. I don't. I, I just told you that I answered your question. You, if I'm in Wales, then yes. In Wales, potentially. So the, <laughs> the, the fact past. is that those, those, those but, frogs yeah. have escaped and populated Wales. So potentially, yes. I don't know if it would work with other frogs, but in the UK, there could conceivably be a population of frogs that you could pee on to test if you're pregnant. Mm, although right. that is generally not going to be useful for you. No, no. How can you? How are you meant to tell? What happens to the frog? The frog when you changes color. I think. Does it? Or no. is it sick? Let's get the two lines appear. No, on the frog. <laughs> no, the frog. The frog lays out. No, that's for COVID. The frog uh, spawns. Okay, sorry. Oh, sorry. The frog spawns. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> changes color. It's a. It's like a. It's like the indicator uh, fluid. You know, like yeah. like your your strips. The, your litmus strips. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the frog just says you are pregnant. <laughs> it changes right. color. And it literally just shows you are pregnant written on the back of the frog. <laughs> God works in mysterious ways. So if you're pregnant and you pee on a frog, the frog itself then lays eggs. I, I think it. I think it spawns. Yeah. I, I, yeah. it, because what happens is there is a specific hormone that when you get pregnant, it's almost immediately produced in massive, um, in, in relatively massive quantities, uh, in your and it, it's released your, through your urine, and that. Uh, hormone, I think, also then triggers uh, uh, that yeah. process in the frog. If you want a more Ooh. thorough explanation of that, we did we did cover this, I think, in uh, probably the uh, eugenics and birth control episode, I think. Mm. Or we did it in a bonus episode. Just check through the Psy Guys canon. Just listen to all Just the Just listen to all of them. You'll find it. Yeah. So back to the history, because we've got to get through this. We've got the pig cornea in 1838. So that was 65 years before they attempted it with a human cornea. Uh, and then we've got the 1920s. We, uh, we've spoken about this before, I'm fairly sure, in the Human Z episode. Uh, they took chimp testicles and they sewed them into human oh, men God, to rejuvenate yeah. them. And it didn't work. Mm. Of course it didn't. It's chimp testicles just sewn into. No, of course it didn't work. Um, we might. I said. I literally have written here. We we may have mentioned this before, possibly in the human Z episode. My 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 disdain was not at you. No, it no, was with yes. the man who decided to sew chimp testicles. But it's just. It's how prevalent it was. It was very prevalent. I don't think so. I I, I think it was one guy doing it. Oh really? But, I thought it was like people. Some people would go and get chimp testicles oh. sewn into themselves. You know, I don't know. So what we should do, Horrible. instead of instead of making a bold statement, yeah. if anyone wants to know more about this, go ahead and check out our Human Z episode. Okay. Um, if it's not there, then there's a playlist of animal-based episodes. It will be in one of those. Yeah. yeah. From my recollection, I'm fairly sure there were like some prominent people who we would have heard of who are rumored to have had chimp testicles or maybe even, maybe actually just other men's testicles sewn into their testicles. In the mm. 1920s? I don't know when, but I uh, that's recalled from the annals of some memory. Oh, I mm. um, it does, the, yeah, it something does about well. sewing something into your testicles to rejuvenate yourself, and it didn't work. But quite a lot of people have. that is a common safe. that is a common thing that like people tend to focus on. But moving on, we've got chimp kidneys in 1963 to 1964. They didn't have dialysis back then. There was a human kidney shortage. They did it to 13 people, and I don't know what happened to 12 of them. One of them 
uh, was able to work for nine months and suddenly died from what is believed to be an electrolyte disturbance. I have no more information on this one. I thought you were going to say kidney failure. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I mean, electrolyte disturbance is yeah, it's uh, from related the kidneys. to kidneys. Yeah. I have no idea about this. I saw it as I was looking through the brief history. If you want to do a history of this, by the way, if you want to do a history of Xenotransplants episode or look into this chimp kidney story, we can absolutely do it in a future episode. But I, I just want to give some like much needed background to this, to this surgery. Yeah. Uh, so this one, I, I literally have no idea what was going on with it. But 1964, the same year or a year afterwards, in some cases, they took a chimp heart uh, and they transplanted it into a person, which I think we've also spoken about before. Chimp, uh, the chimp died. Of course the chimp died. But the person died within two hours. So it <gasps> wasn't great. Uh. But in 1966, we took a chimp liver um, and we, we put it into a person. And then I think in 90, by 1992, that surgeon or that doctor was able to get a patient to live for up to 70 days with a baboon liver inside of them 70 days is not a long time yeah but if you're if you're terminally ill 70 days is not dreadful it's not it's it's well, better than it's better than zero days yes right you know yeah. i mean if you've got like a, like very like if you've got liver failure yeah. yeah and you get your liver replaced with a baboon liver and you live for 70 days hmm, you know it's pretty good it's not gonna get funded on the nhs though is it no. <laughs> i mean you'd be surprised uh so then 1993 uh pig islet cells um those are pancreatic cells i believe so they were used to te- treat i think type 1 diabetes mm. that was in 1983 and in 2021 just last year there was a pig kidney transplant and i've actually got a quote explaining this it says last year a team from new york university langone health new york new york usa attached a genetically modified pig kidney to a woman with no brain activity who was being kept alive by a ventilator the woman's family gave permission for the operation the researchers connected the kidney to blood vessels on the upper leg and observed it for 54 hours they reported that it functioned normally without rejection that was um, published in a Lancet article in uh, well, 2022, this year, which you can find in the description of this video. So that is just a brief history of xenotransplants. Like we've, you can see a lot of failures, and then we started mm-hmm. doing human organ, like uh, organ transplants, and we were quite good at that. And we're just now sort of swinging back around to using animals because we now understand a lot more about the immune system, and we're able to manipulate genetics in order to get around that. But We'll get to that in a, in just a second. So I want to talk about the sort of major risks and obstacles when it comes to uh, xenotransplants, and there are two major risks and obstacles. To it's from like sort of my viewpoint of what I've read into, and it's the two actions as I call them: rejection and infection. Those are the two main obstacles: oh. rejection and infection. So rejection is something we all fear. I am very sure. <laughs> Especially when your organs reject you. So unlikable. Oh God. <laughs> so whenever you transplant an organ from one person to another, there's always the risk of rejection, obviously. What, ha- what that means is, do you know what that means? Yes, where the immune system attacks the, the organ you've just transplanted. Exactly. So the immune system recognizes the organ or tissue or whatever it is as foreign and then just starts destroying it because that's what its job is. Is it's the made. immune system? Well, I, I, I literally have it written that the immune system is very complex and very good, but it's also very dumb. And yes. I don't mean that in like a silly, like ooh, silly, silly immune boy. system sense, but it's it's just very very good at what it does. It's very could be very very specific. Yes, it didn't exactly evolve for having other things sewn into you. Yes, <laughs> so no, you can forgive it. <laughs> exactly. Of course. Yeah, it's but trying its best. It's just it doesn't see the big picture, right? Yeah. It it has its one specific task. That it does, like yeah. each each like sort of part of your immune system does the one specific task, and part of that task is recognizing mm. something that's foreign, then destroying it. It's like quite with xenophobic, absolute isn't it? prejudice. Yeah, yeah, it is literally, mm, literally xenophobia. xenophobic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it like it, there are a, there are obviously like a different number of ways that you can destroy things with the immune system. Um, some of them more specific, some of them less specific. But again, the main thing to take away from this is the immune system doesn't know whether something is good or bad. It just knows whether it's it, it, it doesn't even know whether something is foreign. Technically, yeah. it only knows that it, it is registered. Uh, it, it is something that it, it doesn't recognize as being a part of your body. Mm. And it, in cases of, of like, um, you know, um, autoimmune disorders, it literally could f- like incorrectly recognize something as foreign. So mm. it doesn't even tell foreign properly necessarily. And it's a really good way to think about it, right? Because when you look at autoimmune disorders, you can kind of think, oh, the immune system is kind of like the Hulk, right? Like in some very, <laughs> yeah. like in that, like, in, with the Avengers, before the Hulk got smart, what they would do is take the Hulk and then just kind of aim him because <laughs> the Hulk really likes to smash stuff. He does, mm. yeah. He loves smashing. Your immune system loves to smash, but it Sometimes can't... it smashes it, like, itself. Yeah, like it's not very good. At, like it, it, it doesn't care what it's smashing or why. 
It's just you tell it what to smash, mm. and it's like, cool, I love Smash, and I'm going to smash that so good. Yeah. Just watch me. Like in Thor 3 when the Hulk smashes Thor. It's, yeah. it's like, but he's my friend from work. It's doesn't like, make no, sense, I like to smash. Hulk smashes anyway. Or when he smashes Serta, and, yeah. and Thor is like, hey, no, we, we want that to happen. That is literally <laughs> a transplant, right? Like, the like Hulk sees Serta and is like, oh, well, that's a, that's a big monster. I need yeah. to attack it. And Thor is like, no, no, no. We want this big no. monster. It's big, helping This us. big monster good in this case. Exactly, yeah. right? And so I guess in that case, Thor would be immunosuppressants. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I am lost. So in autoimmune disorder, obviously your body starts, your immune system starts recognizing parts of your body as foreign and then starts attacking it. And again, really what I'm saying here is that its job, the immune system, um, it doesn't have a job. It's just a story that we tell. The immune system, and I'm going to grossly oversimplify here, uh, just recognizes and then destroys stuff. That mm. is, to put it like as simply as possible, that is what it does. Recognize and destroy. Like yeah. it's, it, that's, that's its main thing. Um, and the way that the immune system recognizes stuff, do you know how it does that? The little uh, um, spike proteins on the surface of things. No? Well, just proteins on the surface. Yeah, so the yeah. proteins on the surface of, um, uh, the, you know, like the proteins on the surface of uh, mm. cells or any sort of foreign body. Uh, if it's got something on the surface of it that it recognizes, I don't even think it necessarily has to be a protein. Uh, don't quote me on that. I'm, in, in, obviously, in a biological context, it is generally proteins. But um, It's just like shapes, though, isn't it? It's, yeah. yeah, proteins really just turns into shape. And also, there's the whole thing about bonds and... It gets very complex. Yeah, I'm sure. I I'm do really not want to it. talk about biochemistry. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> biochemistry is one of those things where, like, if you zoom out, super cool and interesting. Like, oh wow, this is really great. And you zoom in and you get to the protein level, and you're like, cysteine bonds. Like, stop. It's very, it's very <laughs> complex. And like, honestly, I'm glad I'm not in uni anymore. <laughs> um, but you. So obviously, do you know what we do? You mean I've already mentioned it, but you know what we do when it comes to human transplants? How we stop them from rejecting organs, right? immunosuppressants yeah exactly yeah. we just put you on a drugs that say to your immune system yeah calm down just in general Whoa. chill and that <laughs> effectively stops you from like rejecting yeah. the organ because your yeah. immune system is generally just kind of dampened overall yeah so it's not attacking the organ obviously that leaves you somewhat vulnerable to diseases as well because you've got a slightly under you've got an underactive immune system mm. but that is preferable to being dead with no organs right that's true yeah 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 I think so. Yeah, yeah. Good. If I had to pick. Great. I yeah. have a therapist on speed dial. If you answered incorrectly, you would have been right on the right on the phone with them. No, I, that was a on joke. the podcast. Don't don't get. <laughs> yeah, that's a, <laughs> it's a new a new section of the show <laughs> where we just call and get some therapy. Ding, ding, oh, it's going to be a long episode. <laughs> it's time for therapy. PTSD episode. That would have been great. Uh, so, you might think that we could do the same with xenotransplants. You might think that, right? That we could just give you an immunosuppressant and it'll be fine. Is but it just too foreign? It's too foreign. Yeah. So oh. I kind of lied a little bit earlier when I said that it just recognizes foreign. It, there are different levels of foreign. There's, this is human, but not me. Mm. And then there's, this is not human Very and obviously foreign. not me. Mm. Right? Like this is, <laughs> this is something else. Super foreign. Like, yeah. which is real bad. Because like, human and not you is probably maybe slightly less bad than not you because not you is probably like not human not human is probably like a bacterium yeah. or a virus something that is that is uh, there to do you harm in some way right so your body is like yeah let's get this and also uh when it recognize like on a human sort of uh, on human material in your body your your immune system can probably recognize some parts of it right as in oh here uh, are some human yeah. things yeah it's human <laughs> Because you're a human also, and it recognizes some of those parts, right? So it, 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 it's slightly more recognized than something that is just completely foreign. So this can just basically make your immune system go into overdrive. It results in something called hyperacute uh, hyper rejection, I think it's called. So hyperacute rejection is the name of this thing when your immune system just goes nuts. And in this case, immunosuppressive drugs on their own just will not cut it. So what do you think? I've also only mentioned this. So what do you think we're, we're doing about this? What do you think we're doing to combat the problem of hyperacute rejection? You're genetically modifying the pig first. Exactly. So w oh. what are we doing to the pig? Making it grow closer to human heart. Or just a human heart. No, not even that. We're not, not closer to human heart. What, what are you going to say? Putting human DNA inside the pig. Yeah, fully. Oh. So, uh, so what we're doing is, it's not that the pig, the heart is still a pig heart. But what we're what we're doing is we're making the cells look like human cells oh, to your immune so system. Weird. And the way that you do that is by just giving them giving 
the outsides of the cells a little zhuzh to make them to ah. make them have some of the proteins that your immune system will like recognize as human. It. Yeah, more or less. Okay, <laughs> but, like okay. So put it this way: um, Jamp wants to. I want Jamp to help me work, right? But my boss is a real stickler. I'm not allowed to get anyone to come in and help uh, uh, help me work. And if my boss sees anyone that is not me in my workspace, mm. will go nuts. I will probably get fired. Mm. So I give Jamp a Kari mask. Yeah, yeah. And it's and and my boss is like, well. Yeah, I suppose that's Corey. Yeah. yeah, okay, I guess. So this Corey. is it is like you are growing yeah. abnormal pig heart. It just also then has a little layer on it, which means it's not. You said, I, I know it's. I know that's an oversimplification. I just mean that you're not growing a human heart inside a pig. So let, yeah, let me put it this way: on a cellular level, it is a it is a pig heart with pig cells. Yeah. But the outsides of the cells, we're changing that. We're changing what the cells look like. Like like I'm saying, we're literally putting a mask on. We're, we're basically putting a mask on the cells. Of the heart, mm. so it's a pig heart with pig cells. Mm. It's just that we've made it so that the pig cells look a little bit more like human cells to your immune system. And the way we do that is by adding in some extra proteins and just taking off some other uh, some on proteins. The surface of yeah, the on the surface, yeah, on the surface. Sorry, mm. on the surface of the cells. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, just adding on some extra proteins that are humany proteins mm. and taking off some piggy proteins mm. uh, from the surface of the cells. And uh, it's this... not dissimilar to the the way that the vaccine of the recent thing was. Um, like creating the spike proteins so, in order to train it, but it's not creating the rest of it. It's just creating the little spikes. So that's it, it operates on exactly the same principle because yeah. your immune system just rec your immune system recognizes stuff by surface proteins, mm. um, generally. And so if you just like it, you don't need to make a whole thing for your immune system to recognize it necessarily. You just need to make the thing that it can recognize. So why, out of interest, why don't bacteria or viruses evolve to or do they evolve that's not how well they do well they, they potentially can but that's not how evolution works except you know because they don't it, evolution doesn't work to choose the absolute best method and it's an arms race as well right, right? like if you're i mean if if you've got um uh if you've got a uh, like bacteria like probably i think the issue is probably the speed the way that it's working It'd be very difficult yeah. for for that to happen and i suppose you can't look like a generic you could look like a generic human cell but humans still reject human cells if they're not self so they, they're still like if even if you're a bacteria and you evolve to sort of be acceptable to kind of like a an average human level you're still going to get attacked as if you're a different human that's not well, me i think maybe i think it, i think some sort of bacteria and i think some viruses do um have a bit of camouflage, mm. if we call it that, right? Mm. Where they they can be a little bit more invisible to the immune system, but it's it's not a static thing. So the immune system is like it's incredible, right? It is constantly trying new things out, and so I think at some point someone will be able, like, th there will be like some kind of sort of antibody that's made that can, or you will be to recognize some some part of like the bacteria sort of mm. thing. So it's. It's 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 a difficult one to think about because it's not static, yeah. and evolution doesn't go what's the best thing. It's just what will survive, sort of thing. But could I mean could we? I mean obviously you don't necessarily know the answer to this, but theoretically you could engineer something that looks like that. Oh, easily. Yeah. Stupid so it's easily. Like, uh, it's it's a dangerous thing that looks like a human thing. Oh my god, mad easy. Yeah. Like I mean, like the, I, when I say stupid easy, I mean. Is, as far as these things go, it's complex, yeah. But like, you could do that. That's very fully. concerning. <laughs> you just need to get a bacteria to express surface <laughs> proteins that are like I. Li I think we've done that literally. Bacteria, surface, protein, human. Dangerous bacteria that are like Scooby Doo villains. Just the mask. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, um, that mask. <laughs> I mean, I think the, the a, a big thing is like bacteria obviously have uh, can have weird membranes as well. So there's there's difficulties there with that. But I think you could I. I may be wrong about that. I may be, but I'm, I'm fairly sure I'm not. I'm pretty sure you could get a bacteria in some way to express surface proteins that are similar enough, that are similar to humans. Whether that would fool the immune system or not, I don't know. But mm. it, yeah, it's it's a bit... It, 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 theoretically, unless I'm forgetting something, the, it's possible mm. to do something like that. Well, that's nice to know. Yeah, but, it's, it's, uh, yes, it's, but it's harder. When I say it's easy... It, it it's easy. It would be, to my knowledge, it would be easy enough to get a, a bacteria, a bacteria, like you know, a strain of bacteria to express certain surface proteins. 
it would not necessarily be easy enough to get bacteria to express certain surface proteins that would make them um, uh, like basically invisible to your yes. immune system and also make it very dangerous. Yes. Right? Like that. that is where you start getting more complex probably. Yes. But I wouldn't be too worried about this sort of stuff. So obviously I've said what could we do but that's yeah genetically alter them to make their to make the, the look them look a little bit more like human cells to um your immune system and that's the that's the main thing of sort of rejection done so infection is a little bit more complex it's mm. it's a little bit of a tougher nut to crack so cross species infection is always a worry we know about zoonotic viruses um and how they're often the causes for major <gasps> outbreaks no way uh, and Zoonotic viruses obviously being the ones that come from other animals, cross-species viruses. So viruses and other parasites, and yes, I know that viruses are probably technically not parasites, but it's an easier thing to say. They all depend on living inside of another... You know what I mean, okay? So <laughs> they generally don't want to be deadly or hugely dangerous to their hosts. And why do you think that is, Jamp? Because they want to live inside the host. Yeah. And so I mean, but, and spread from host to host to host. So if it's dangerous to the host and it kills the host, then that just kind of cuts off their access point. Exactly to other people. Exactly. So and the reason that um and that's exactly why um you know if the host population dwindled, then the virus doesn't have anything to keep it replicating, and it depends on its host to replicate. Yeah. Uh, so it it has to have a host to jump into to do that. And that's why zoonotic viruses can be such an issue because we have different immune systems from different animals. So if we've got an animal that has like, uh, that's, 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 you know, very in tune with this virus and the virus doesn't harm the animal very much, but it if it jumps into a human, it would do. Um, if it were to jump into a human, then it's not geared up for the human immune system and it can just be really, really virulent and sort of really deadly. Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily want to be, you know, if we tell the story that a virus wants, it doesn't want to be deadly, but it's just not tuned to being in a human. And so yeah. it's going to just... It's trying to, to attack it, another animal. Yeah, it's yeah. trying to live in another animal yeah. in enough to like keep replicating, but not so yeah. much that it necessarily yeah. kills it, or another organism, rather. Yeah. Um, and it's... So like what mi might be a mild disease in one animal um, could be very deadly or very easily spread in another. So it's kind of like the whole climate change thing, I think. So we lived on the planet in relative harmony. And then we kind of, and I'm going to simplify here. Then we kind of discovered coal and we discovered um, oil, like crude oil and, and gas and natural gas. And then we started burning that stuff. We started making plastics. Mm. And it was this sort of new resource. We jumped into this sort of, in that in this sort of analogy, we've jumped into a new host and we're just running wild with it. And then we're realizing, oh, <laughs> we oh we need to live here it's having a bad Whoops. effect yeah yeah maybe we should stop a virus obviously can't think maybe i should stop it can just of uh, like randomly mutate until those mutations add up to evolution where it's just less yeah. uh less dangerous less right yeah yeah so that is that is the kind of overview of the issue with infection and in this case or sort of the background and in this case retroviruses could be a real issue so retroviruses are viruses that insert themselves into your dna those could be in the organs and then those can infect human cells and then those could spread oh, no. amongst people which would be a great start for a zombie movie by the way just, just <laughs> perfect but that doesn't necessarily mean that the retrovirus would infect humans or that it could even cause disease if it did i've got a quote here from biotechnically biotechnology innovation organization from 2018 it says xenotransplantation opponents voice concerns regarding the unpredictable nature of microorganisms they point to existing human viruses suspected to have originated in animals human immunodeficiency virus uh, hiv uh, simian immunodeficiency virus and bovine spongiform encephalopathy BSE, which uh, people developed uh, Kreutzfeldt Jacob disease, the human equivalent to BSE. They express concern that xenotransplantation puts society as well as the individual recipient at risk for the disease. Basically, what they're saying is all, the, all these other diseases that have jumped from animals into humans have been big bads. We're just asking for trouble if we're, you know, if we're doing this. Like it could put the person at risk, and it could put everyone at risk. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, a study in 1999 uh, looked at people who had medical treatments using living pig tissues and found no uh, infected individuals. But they did find pig cells just around the body, uh, not in Ooh, just in the bit. They, they, they got so on holiday. <laughs> Going sure. traveling. Uh, but it does show, show that pig cells could potentially exist in the body without causing too much of an issue, which is uh, good to know. It's positive. So basically with this one, it seems like we just need to be careful and pay close attention to the pig parts that we're putting in people. <laughs> Watch them really mm. hard. Yeah. Nope, I don't see any naughty viruses just yet. <laughs> <laughs> and if this is a few but years ago, it would have been 
very ripe for a joke about David Cameron putting his parts in a pig. Uh, oh. Hey, that's a pretty big risk for uh, <laughs> cross human, cross species disease. We need to stamp out the Bullingdon Club. Uh, yeah, but if we, I think if we use that front, we might actually get it done. Yeah, the whole classism thing is it's really not working. No, thus far, but stamping out all of humanity. We, we didn't like... think we had to tell people to not put their penises into pigs. And then we went, well, maybe let's try some so, the classist aim so that you don't do it. And they're like, no, nah, we're still going to do it, man. We're like, okay, how about the pandemic aim? Uh, uh, we'll think about it. Okay, fine. Look, one of, my, go back to one of the things I've realized after researching this podcast for years <laughs> is you need to put warnings on everything because there will be someone that does the thing that you think is so obvious no one should do. <laughs> Like put their penis in a pig. Yeah, or mm. you know anything stupid. Pigs should come with warning labels. <laughs> don't don't put your penis in this. I mean, I don't think you should be thinking about pigs coming at all, Jamp. What? Why is that a focus? Why do you want to make pigs come? Huh? Did I say come? Did you, you said they'd come, come with come warning labels. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah, they come for thirty minutes. I get you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plenty of they time would come to, out the warning. Just get a warning label out. <laughs> uh, thirty minutes, man. Where's your warning label? <laughs> in your pocket. Come on. <laughs> So the pig heart transplant, how did they test the pig hearts? It wasn't the first xenotransplantation with a pig heart. They have already put a modified pig heart into the abdomen of a baboon. And Ooh. how long do you think that the baboon pig heart worked for? 37 seconds. No, we just put it in a person as well. Why would it? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. maybe it didn't work as well. Oh man, it, oh, the, 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 the baboon lasted less than, an, uh, less than a minute. 37 days. Let's just pop it in David. Now, um... We're we're getting closer. Thirty seven years. <laughs> thirty seven. <laughs> Something some unit. Some multiple of thirty seven. So it's three like years. Oh, um, okay. How well, many days? Seven? I, seven? Sure. Okay, let's just say three years and seven days. Thank I you. I don't know. Well, I'm glad I was right. The heart worked How many really, weeks is thirty seven uh, no hang no, on. No, it's not. Damn. So the, the heart worked <laughs> months. Yeah. Thirty seven oh, months. Oh it may three well years be thirty seven months. Oh, Could be thirty seven months. Month. How about that? I guess um, this is this is a very painful episode. <laughs> <laughs> so this, as I said, uh, the heart stopped working for three. In, uh, the heart stopped working um, after three years, or it worked for three know. years until it was rejected. But apparently, and this is one I'm not so sure about, but it was rejected because they stopped giving it a specific antibody that prevented rejection. So they were trying it. They were trying something out. Uh, and it didn't work. I'm not sure the way so actually, I read that isn't this... that isn't saying it stopped working. That's saying we did something different and it died. I don't know if it's so much they did something different. I feel like they just stopped giving it the medication because oh, they. Well, but, but my point is, if you're saying it worked for three years, well, it may have worked for ten years. Oh yeah, just yeah. Did, like if you if you have a cancer treatment and then you're told you have to take the tablet. You don't go, this treatment kept someone alive for this amount of time. Oh, but also we stopped giving them these we tablets. Stopped giving it to I, just, them. I don't know why they stopped giving it, whether to see if it would affect it or whether yeah. they just they wanna, didn't want to continue paying for did it. Did they want to test if I'm it would sure survive it's that. without it? Yeah. Because actually giving somebody a, a heart transplant and then living, like you said, about three 70 years, days, yeah. three, three years when the alternative is dying is already like, yeah. wow, fantastic. Let's yeah. let's pursue this and stop spending all this money on this uh, monkey uh, medication, which... Let's just you know? go ahead. Like, let's let, kill the monkey. Let's just move to a guy, right? <laughs> like, find, someone find a guy. And also, if we waste all the money on this monkey meds, we can't give it to the guy. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> it's an interesting one though, because it's sort of like it's sort of like getting into the discussion of like that monkey is basically a veteran uh, of 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 a of a war. Yeah, salute the monkey. <laughs> Look, dude. And it's like, why is he not entitled to the rest of his life? He took a big risk. Look, my friend, I try very hard it's a very difficult job i try very hard to shelter you from the real world yeah in terms of them just killing animals that they work with <laughs> i try not to mention it i really thought, try not I to mean, do you I not know, remember the scientists yeah. also try not to mention it yeah I, they all yeah they do but i mean i just feel like it brings the episodes down a little bit yeah but yeah but yeah no it, i mean it's one of those things in the back of your mind you know they're th those animals are not like those rats they're testing on <laughs> Well, sure, yeah. Like, but it's like the, 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 if we're going to, as a society, we're going to do these sort of animal experimentation, like obviously it's not going to be part of the funding model to keep an animal alive indefinitely once you've got the proof you need. Mm. But as a society, if we're going to do this and an animal actually, like I, through no choice of its own, its own took a large risk and then we just go, cool, that worked. You actually successfully passed the test 
and we're not going to pay for you to be alive anymore. Like, that's it just kind of sucks. One of my friends from home, when they were in uni, uh, their job, they had to kill him. The person? They, killed their, they had to kill the, the lab rats, the lab mice. Uh, oh, what, themselves? They had to do it? I think they did, yeah. Or they Why at least talked to me about it. Why can't they just let them free? Well, well, it depends what experiment they've done that. on them, obviously. But, <laughs> <laughs> it, well, but there'll be some experiments where you can just let them free. I just feel like, honestly, in some cases, the kinder thing is to kill them. It's just, it, the issue. One of the issues is you can't reuse them. They're not reusable because they've already been tainted yeah, by the they're previous not control experiment. anymore. Yeah. Uh, another thing is that these animals are not socialized. Like if you like with rats, socialization is incredibly important. Okay, put it this way: if you were locked up for, I mean, let's say a test runs for two years, yeah, uh, for a year, right? Rats live uh, about a year and eleven months. Let's say it survives; it's, it's its actual life expectancy for this rat is two years, right? You spend a year in a test, half of your life in a test, and then you get let out to be a pet. I yeah, I retirement. Just, okay. Maybe it's one of those tests of where they give the rat drugs or where they make it have depression. Uh -huh. Like I, I the, 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 the what we do to animals in animal testing is horrific, and I generally try not to think about it. Mm. Actually, I think our bonus episode. Well, it's actually, this is the thing. Either our bonus episode or an episode for uh, another episode is going to be very specifically about horrific animal treatment. You, um, you saved them all up. You say you've sheltered me. <laughs> you've actually saved them for this one bombshell. Just of an get episode. it all out Big in one go. I mean, dump. every three years, I'm just gonna like just c Rip concentrate all of the horrible <laughs> animal stuff, and then let you wait for three more years. Yeah, to forget rip it off about like a band aid. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it's such an interesting thing because, like, so from an, in an uh, uh, this might get clipped out because it's long, but in an economics term, so in, in economics, you have this idea of externalities, which is like. Uh, you know, you drive your car, the cost to you is your time, the cost of the petrol, the cost of upkeeping the car, and then the cost to the environment and to the general population is, is called the externality, which is like worse air quality, sound pollution, that sort of thing, right? So, and, and then you have positive externalities, that's a negative externality, and then you have a positive externality, so like, uh, I don't know, uh, the Moderna doing their research into the vaccine, uh, they've done that. Po pro you could argue primarily for profit but the positive externality is everyone doesn't get a disease and other industries don't have their workers off sick for as long and so there's positive externalities to that right um the amount of positive externality that are created by lab animals is just humongous and we just don't give anything back to that animal at all yeah and i don't understand why that's not even a topic of discussion. It's like that's such a gigantic philosophical decision that you are just because that is a it's a it's not you know you're it's abuse. It's a massive on massive scale abuse. Same thing as as arguably the meat industry is a massive. Uh, I think like it's better than the meat industry personally because it has a positive a massive positive. It's it's, an, it's yeah. almost necessary. Yeah, um, of course. But it's just like there's no discussion whatsoever about this, especially with the, on the level of what would be considered like a higher level animal, like a chimpanzee mm -hmm. or an ape. It's just we've just completely desensitized ourselves to it. And it's absolutely insane. And I don't know how we can consider ourselves to be like anything other than a potentially horrible species when we, we we only it's like the good guy philosophy you know like if you consider yourself a good guy and you just consider yourself good guy and then and then you manipulate your own con your own perception of the world yeah, anything you do is uphold, good because you're a good guy yeah to uphold your self-image as good guy mm. we have that with us as a species as like oh we just filter out all the stuff that makes us bad guy and we focus on all the stuff that makes us good guy and it's just so weird that there's no discussion about it and there's no like oh well maybe if you maybe everyone all the scientists can have a little rat ha, ha, pet rats that are all their pet rats i know there's too many but like it doesn't no, mean i know i know there's no because there's the no problem good is way. massive doesn't mean you don't do anything about no, I, it I, I know i know I, I i try not to think about it this is something i've tried to put out of my mind for a while because it's such a big question that i don't I don't even, ha it's not that I don't have an answer to it. Of course I don't have an answer to it because I'm a, I'm just a person. Mm. But I don't even have, uh, I don't know where to start, yeah. right? Like, when, okay, so when it comes to like prison abolition or like, you know, the, the problem with prisons, yeah. that's a big problem. And I know what I think about it and I know what can be done. 
like I, as in like I've I've read and I have an understanding and I'm yeah. like I like I have an idea of where we can go. There seems like a way out of this. When it comes to lab animals, yeah, I I don't know an alternative. Like people talk yeah. about tissues. We've talked about this before. People talk about tissues and using organs that are grown or har- harvested it's, without killing. That's I'm not like the same as it. But in it, going just from that to jumping into a human mm. is yeah. such a leap, and so many people will die. And in the system that we've got right now, it's going to be poor people. It's going to be native people. It's going to be, you know, like uh, people of color yeah. and all of the people that are basically sort of, sort of stepped on by society. And that's not, if I have to ask myself, would I rather like, you know, rats and monkeys and, and mice be killed or would I rather yeah. people be killed? Probably the rats and monkeys and mice, right? Sure. It depends on the people, obviously, but I, I mean, it's it's a tough one because yeah. I, it, it's I can't see I can't even see a light at the end of the tunnel. I don't mm. know where to go. I don't know what the solution is. It's so difficult. It's frustrating being in that position. It's so difficult having a situation where you just don't you don't know. You just don't. What what can you do? I get, but what I think bugs me about it, like the idea of testing animals. Yes, that's a really difficult subject. But then what? What is strange to me is that even if, if you're like you're forcing a risk, you're, you're forcing a game on these animals, right? Which is like you might die, um, etc. Uh, but then even if you don't die, even if you survive, the outcome is still dreadful for you. Mm. It's like, I, I, and it's one of these things where like you're living as a society, you are creating wealth off the back of this thing, and then eat like. You're just harvesting all of this potential for yourself. And even the ones that make it through, you're just then going, right, stick them in a gas chamber and kill them. It's not even like, you know, lab rats have a 30% chance of survival. It's like lab rats have a 30% chance of survival. And if they survive, they have a 100% chance of being dead straight away Mm. as well. It's just like you can have the conversation about whether it's right to test on animals, but then you have to have, if you decide yes, you then have to then have a follow-up conversation on like, but what do we do with the ones that survive? Do we just kill them too? Well, I've actually just so uh, while you were talking there, and I mean it's this is a tough one. So I was looking up laboratory primates uh, and their lives in and after research. This is a study mm. from 2016. Our study. This is a, an article from 2016, a scientific one, of course. Um, and it'll be linked in the description. Obviously, I had a look at it, and it's uh, it, it was saying, and I don't know if regulations have changed in 2016, but says here, once all data have been collected and the study is completed, the PI is left with a decision of what to do with the monkey. They can continue on to another study in our lab, be sold to another lab, or be euthanized for tissue histology. However, in our case, they rarely can move on to another experiment or another lab due to the regulation that only one major surgical pr- procedure is allowed per animal. And obviously, if they're, if it's the same implants being used for, you know, think, then they can move the monkey on. But it basically sounds like what they're saying is that they're... Um, they are just letting, they're just euthanizing the monkeys, which feels, like, killing rats and killing mice feels That's one fine. Thing. Yeah. I, I don't say that, I, like, I don't yeah. like it, but it feels, yeah. killing rats is something that is it, literally in children's films as just a thing, right? Like it, killing a rat sure. is a very normal thing, thing because we see them as pests. Monkeys, on the other hand, we see as our close, some yeah. of our closest relatives. We mm-hmm. literally are, um, I think taxonomically speaking, monkeys yeah. right we are and this is something i found out recently very interesting are we i thought we were apes uh, mm, apes are monkeys the issue is that ah. the, the tree splits off old world monkeys and new world monkeys we are sitting between them on that tree oh. really annoyingly so so that if you want to call both old world monkeys and new world monkeys monkeys you must also concede that all of the apes are monkeys also <laughs> okay which fantastic wow. um great great stuff but yeah you know we think of monkeys as being um as having sort of like a personality worthy of res- worthy of respect and of life and of like you know, freedom yeah. from pain and all of that stuff but at the very least in 2016 probably still now can just euthanize them and it makes sense because you hack up a monkey what are you gonna do you can't put it back in the wild you can't oh, put it in a pop. zoo Go on. like wh- no. what are you gonna do you have to euthanize it. Why can't you put it in a zoo? If you've just if done, if you've, if, you've taken a healthy, if you've taken a healthy monkey and given it major surgical procedures, yeah, and you've implanted microelectrode arrays into its brain, or you've installed um, an artificial heart, or yeah. whatever, like, and also you probably want to kill it to look at to see how it's affected its tissues in some cases, right? As well, <laughs> right? <laughs> you, you know, yeah, you know, guys. guys. What I mean is, but like. 
if this is what we're doing, let I'm people at- see it. It's the same thing as like pretending we don't kill 150 billion animals a year. It's yeah. like, this is what we no, need man, to I, know what you're doing. If you're going to defend it, know what you're doing first and accept what you're doing and claim what you're doing and own it. Don't just go, oh, let's pretend we're not doing it, but carry on doing it. It's, it's, it think, the thing to me, it's interesting because th- this provides so much utility, not just for humans, but for other animals as well. Yeah. Like It provides utility for basically all of the organisms that we kind of come into contact with mm. um, if we choose to help them, right? Like the, the work that's done probably with those laboratory monkeys has probably made it easier for veterinary care for other monkeys yeah. that we do care about. And for me... I feel very much the way that a meat eater probably. <laughs> yeah, well, I feel very much like the way that a meat eater probably feels when they talk when they talk to a vegan, where a meat eater thinks, "Oh, but I need meat to survive. Like, what else am I going to do? I'm I need to eat meat." But we know that eating meat using animal products for most people is not necessary, and so that's why, to me, obviously, personally, eating meat is morally wrong because it's unnecessary harm. Yeah. Right. And I, I would seek to remove as much unnecessary harm as possible. The, the laboratory testing of animals mm. edges far more into necessary harm for me. I just, I, I, and if I would love to know of a, of a solution to it because I want to reduce harm as much as is practicable and possible. I just don't know how with this and people giving the, the crappy solutions of, well, tissues or organ, you need to understand how something affects an entire body, right? You can't do an organ transplant on, like you know yeah on anything but a full monkey do you think that there's um so you're getting into the conversation of like where does yourself come from but do you think it are there a decent amount of experiments for example on a monkey which which you're doing on the body which you could for example do without a prefrontal cortex i mean sure okay this is this is my issue right and i have thought about this as well that was actually sitting in my sitting like sitting in the back of my head there is that if you want to make him brain dead cool talks about but if you're looking at behaviors yeah. or if you're looking at yeah, how they really react work. to the to this if you want to make that the step between human trials and, and whatnot then sure for some things for things that are about the body and the way the body functions yeah then i suppose you technically could but then also you've got muscle atrophy and you've not got activity so yeah. you can't test xyz you know what i mean so it, you'd be it, you'd be sacrificing your data to some extent probably but is it is it worth it that's the difficult that's the really difficult question yeah, and that's that. That is ultimately the economic question, which mm. is like, well, we're giving up some of our wealth so that this thing doesn't suffer, and ultimately we don't care. Yeah. So, well, I, I will <laughs> say, I do think that there are probably a lot of cases where we could limit the use of use of like um, non brain dead animals or full animals and just use organs or tissues or whatever. I'm I'm sure that we could scale back our use of lab laboratory, laboratory animals, or at least start to in an the extent. individual things and then scale up to. A monkey or two or three, as opposed to doing everything on ten monkeys, that's twenty not, monkeys. That's not quite exactly what we do, but yeah, no, no, you, right. Yeah, no. But I mean, you could you could have you could use less full monkeys later on by doing some of the experiments on. I mean, I organs. guess probably, yeah. I don't yeah. know enough about this to really make yeah. a like a solid statement, but I do agree with you. I think that yeah, I think it's a tough one. It's tough. But back to the actual pig heart transplant. So we've spoken about a lot of stuff. We spoke about um, this has basically come off of. Uh, than putting a pig heart into the abdomen of a baboon and it lasted three years but they had another baboon and they replaced its heart with a pig heart and that baboon uh, survived for nine months and then died from something that's apparently unrelated to the transplant so it, they were pretty solid okay well this 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 transplant system that we've got seems to work fairly well we can get at least uh, nine months out of the monkey uh, of the baboon and and it dies then from something that's not related to the transplant seems pretty solid seems pretty good and we could get uh a heart to work for three years in the abdomen of a baboon. So this is all pointing in the right direction. And so on the 7th of January, 2022, 57 year old David Bennett received a genetically mo- modified pig heart. Uh, it was as a transplant, by the way, not just a gift. And he had a terminal heart disease that was performed by surgeons of the University of Maryland School of Medicine, led by Bartley Griffith, the director of the university's cardiac transplant program. Uh, and right now, uh, I say right now, so as of recording, David Bennett um, is recovering. He was off the heart and lung mach- uh, machine um, as of the 18th of January. Um, and the FDA had granted permission for the transplant on the 31st of December 2021. So only uh, about a week uh, before they went ahead with the surgery. So they put it through the FDA and they were always fine with it. So the, the quote here from um, 
uh, Griffith, the, the lead sort of lead surgeon on this, we have not seen the top end of how long the donor heart can go on for. We will be disappointed if David, David does not get many months of survival. So they're they're talking in months, right? Mm. If he gets a lot of months, then they're um they'll they'll be happy, right? Like if he gets fewer than mm. a few months, then they're disappointed. But they haven't seen the ceiling of it yet, you know, because the the first that baboon died from an unrelated thing, and the other baboon lasted three years, and then they took it off. Um, so why a pig? Do you think? Why did they decide to put a pig heart into David? Have they got similar immune systems to us? No. Oh. Well, no, that's not really the well, that's not really the reason why. So the kind of answer I was looking for was more. I mean, David wasn't able to get uh, a human heart transplant. That is the main thing. Like they did. Yeah. Like oh right. That is no. The, I said that. But why pig? I was <laughs> opposed to a different thing. Oh well. Um, Jamp said it already earlier in the podcast. It's just pig hearts are really well. Not really similar, but similar enough. Same size. Mm. Same size. Yeah. Same size. Okay. Yeah. Same size. That's that's literally a, it. not not literally. There's sure. obviously other considerations, but one of the main things I saw is that pig hearts are roughly the same size, which makes surgery a whole lot easier. So probably um, similar strength as well, right? Because you need to be able to pump the blood. Yeah. yeah. Although they are hor- uh, vertical, whereas we're horizontal. But they're uh, they're, no, they're horizontal. much larger than us. Yeah. yeah. As well. So uh, yeah. Um, the, the the thing is, I mean, a heart is a heart. Like it's, yeah. I mean, if it's you're roughly the same size animal, I think I reckon it'd probably be roughly relatively the same fine. Strength, yeah. yeah. Um. So you know, but he was ineligible for human transplantation. There weren't any other options for him. Like a, a heart pump was specifically mentioned. He couldn't get an artificial heart pump, so they decided to use a, a pig, because pig hearts are, are similar size to human hearts. So I've got a quote here from, uh, I think from yeah from Griffith. So it says, sewing the pig's heart into the patient's chest cavity was not uniquely difficult, Griffith told The Lancet. The geometry did not quite line up, so we had to do some alterations, but nothing that an experienced cardiac surgeon would not be able to manage. It's pretty solid. So, you know, as far as, as far as, uh, <laughs> as far as surgeries go, apparently popping a pig heart into, into some bloke, Pretty straightforward if you're a cardiac surgeon. Nothing a cardiac surgeon yeah. can't manage. Ah, no, I, I love the I love the vibe that this guy is giving <laughs> into you. Like, uh, there's nothing nothing you can't manage if you're pretty good at heart surgery. You know, yeah. it's like it's pretty straightforward for us heart surgeons. Like when you see a uh, magazine or a book advertising, it's like in all good news agents. <laughs> it's not in the, in the news agent you go to. It's a bad news agent. Yeah, maybe no other cardiac surgeon. He trained for ages and no one else can do it. He just wants to look really cool. Yeah, so. Uh, I've got a question. How did they modify the pig heart? Well, I've already told you this. Like they essentially they had given uh, David immunosuppressive drugs, the, the patient immunosuppressive drugs. Um, they've taken off some of the um, they've taken off some of the outside uh, proteins of the pig, uh, the pig cells on the part, and added six human genes. Um, and- Manually, sorry, they haven't done this in the genetic modification. Genetically, no, they've done it oh, genetically. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Six okay. six human genes. Right. Yeah, yeah. Not just like paint it on. No. Stick no, no, no. It on. So they actually. So what they did is, I think they essentially. Uh, God, how do you do this? I think you take the what's it called, the embryo, the, the little eggy thing before it's fully a pig. You know, pig boy. Uh, then you you muck around with that. You pop it into a <laughs> muck around. With it. Just I'll be back in a second. I'm gonna muck around with this pig heart. Yeah. Yeah. The lab, no, no, not the heart. You, you you the 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 pig before it's. Um, a pig. Oh, muck around the, the embryo. Pig, yeah. You muck, no, no, no. You put muck around with the embryo. The, yeah. Like the right. unborn yeah. pig, yeah. basically. Yeah. Um, and then you mess around with that. P- put it in a pig. So the pig is pregnant with that pig that you've mucked around with. <laughs> Sorry, in the context of a pig, muck around sounds like you're rolling in like a in like a mud. Yeah. Pen. Either that. No, or no, no. I, you know, muck around with his DNA. Muck, muck, mucking around with it. You muck around with his DNA. You know. <laughs> Just, you got to make sure it's a pig. Just got to roll around actually, some mud. They actually made che- uh, yep, ten. A pig. <laughs> they actually made ten genetic changes, um, which is uh, apparently unless you knock out the certain genes, certain genes from the pig, the heart will be rejected within minutes. Oh, yeah. So they knocked out three genes from the pig, and then added in, um, uh, like I think, six human genes, and then made another change to make sure that the pig's heart didn't continue growing. Mm. Inside the new person, otherwise mm. that'd be a pig heart bursting out of you. What happened to my dog? My dog ran around so much, his heart got too big, and then he got, got ill because he had too big a heart. Oh, it's that really is a cute. problem. Yeah, so that is a, that is actually such a, a muscly heart. Mm. Not a pig's heart, though, is it? It can happen to people as well, no. though. No, your your can heart can yeah, use too, too large. Too it's bad. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, they they basically they changed the genes around a little bit, and they gave him an immu- immu- immunosuppressant uh, r- a drug regimen, and then also an anti CD forty antibody, basically an antibody that's against whatever. It doesn't really matter the specifics of this. <laughs> Essentially, what they did is they changed the genes of the pig heart. Well, changed the genes of a pi- of an unborn pig, grew a pig, 
took out the heart, popped it in a bloke, and uh, gave him some drugs so that he didn't reject it. Uh, and what does this mean for the future, do you think? Probably they will do this a lot more. I mean, so I've got a quote here from <laughs> Karen Mashke, I think it is. Uh, there are no ongoing clinical... There are no ongoing clinical trials for xenotransplantation. Uh, the experience of a single patient is not going to provide anywhere near enough safety and effectiveness data for translating the procedure into everyday clinical practice. It really is a proof of concept experiment. Um, and that is also from The Lancet. So it, what a it, downer. Well, <laughs> it, yes and no, because this person, um, Karen Mash, uh, Mash, Mash, Mashi, Mashki, Mashki, I think, didn't look up how to pronounce her name beforehand. But uh, this this uh, Karen uh, has said that uh, there are a lot of questions that need answering before the FDA can approve a clinical trial. How long can we expect the organ recipient to live? What is their quality of life? What mechanisms lead to failure? What are the risks of zoonotic disease transmission? Um, and actually, she was given a grant to work on the ethical policy framework for xenotransplant cl cl uh, clinical trials. Um, so that project is going to run for three and a half years. And a lot of this, like so much of this actually just depends, it relies on how David's doing. So he's going to be like, they're going to watch him, obviously, yeah. uh, to see what's going on, because his experience could actually inform the future directions of the procedure. But yeah, like, essentially, th th this one transplant is not, okay, now it's safe. It's, okay, let's try and build a framework now for testing this for safety. Yeah. And then I think, I don't know, maybe in like 10, 20 years, xenotransplants could be more common. Do you know if they've done any tests on David to like how his blood oxygen levels are and how that, how the how it actually performs i don't know not to my knowledge i mean they probably have done uh, whether that, that's being released to the public or not mm. I, I don't know i mean he was by the 18th of january like so you know a couple months ago he was only um he was only just sort of waking up off the lung machine okay. all that sort of stuff so they haven't sent him for a marathon yet no nah, not quite yet no nah. apparently he is reaching out to people you know he was reaching out to people in the middle of january physically which, or speaking to them i think messaging them or whatever okay you know? uh, yeah <laughs> he can lift his arm no, I think he's doing fairly well. I mean, I I've I checked around for more articles and I did not see that he had uh, you know, had any problems at the time of recording. So, mm. you know. And I, I, I last looked it up today, just to be sure. And I, I hadn't seen anything. So yeah, I mean, as far as I'm aware, if something changes uh, between the recording of this and it coming out, then of course I will I'll add a little something in. I'll pop in right now to give you an update. He's the bodybuilding champion of the world. No. <laughs> he's lived for a hundred years. And David if... Cameron's dread to fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, God. Okay. Anything oh. else you want to say before we move no, on to I'd like the to leave it at that? Quick fire quiz. <laughs> yes. What a great way to end a podcast. <laughs> dun 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 dun. David Cameron edition. No. Uh, <laughs> so the quick fire quiz is the same as always. I'll ask one question. That's one question between the two of you. The first person to buzz in with the correct answer after finish asking the question wins. What do we win, Jap? A lovely pig's heart. Oh, I'm looking forward that. to it. No, I can't provide that. Why not? Because Jap took it. There's loads of it's them. It's in me. You have to Jap has it. a pig heart. <gasps> David, nice yeah. to meet you. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Thanks for reaching out. Now. I'm in oh. witness protection. <clears throat> okay, Luke, what is your buzzer? <laughs> Jap, what is your buzzer? It's going to be mine. <laughs> Very good. Oh, wow, <laughs> dearie me. So my question for you both is, what are the two major concerns with xenotransplants? <laughs> That was neck and neck. I think it was jammed. I first, think the person. Obviously. I think the first person to make the noise again. Oh, <laughs> that's not fair. Rejection and infection. Rejection and infection. Jam, you the win the point. What? Well yeah. done. What? I didn't tell you to go. Also, Jam did get it first. I just wanted to hear you guys. Jam to go either. Yeah, I don't have to. I just wanted to hear both do the noises again. How about you both get a point? Democracy is <laughs> a lie. It's not democracy. This is a, I don't know, an autocracy. <laughs> No, uh, you both get a point. Well done. And I will like to. I would like to add something to our audience watching. Please help me out. I remember a show from when I was a, a kid or a movie, and there was a joke of a character who had a monkey heart, and they couldn't do too much activity because they had like a monkey heart. And I tried to search for it so much when I was researching this, and I couldn't find it. So if you know what the TV show or movie is that was probably skewed at kids in the nineties or noughties, where a character had a monkey heart. As a joke, let me know, please. I think that was Postman Pat, wasn't it? <laughs> Tracy Beaker. <laughs> Before we go, we would like to so thank... That's why Elaine was such a pain. <laughs> all of our patrons, with a very special thank you to executive producer Rosa Rodriguez, and thank you for watching. You can find the full references for this episode in the description. Subscribe for new episodes every Sunday, and why not leave us a nice wee comment? You can support the pod over at patreon.com forward slash SciGuys, or you can find and contact us at SciGuysPod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and at SciGuys on TikTok too. Or head over to SciGuys.co.uk, or send us an email at SciGuysPod at gmail.com. 
That's SciGuysPod at gmail.com. SciGuysPod at gmail.com. You can follow me at NotCore everywhere. You can follow me at Jamkin everywhere. You can follow me at Luke Cutforth everywhere. Well, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>